going to mug me. I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Beef and Marathon. Download Veely now. Fifteen dead, twenty-three wounded, shot with planning and precision, without conscience or prejudice. Shooting at random, irrespective of race or gender. Their victims were young, old, black, white, male, female. The Washington snipers were 41-year-old John Allen Mohammed and his 17-year-old accomplice Lee Boyd Malvo. If their paths had never crossed, would they have murdered so many, or were they born to kill? October 2002, ordinary Americans feared for their lives, too frightened to put petrol in their cars or let their children play outdoors. For 23 horrific days, a series of random sniper killings terrorized Washington, D.C. A walk down the high street would be a gamble with life and death. These two individuals were cold-blooded murderers. They didn't care about who they killed. No one really expected that it would be a, a man and a boy uh, working together as a, as a sniper team. Well, I think people began to be scared um, when they realized that the shootings were random. You had to come to grips with the fact that uh, there could be somebody pointing a gun at you as you sat in your car. They were just picking people at random. If you were out there where they could get to you, you were gone. Lee Malvo was born in Kingston, Jamaica on February the 18th, 1985, to Una James and Leslie Malvo. His childhood was not always a happy one. Dewey Cornell was Malvo's court-appointed psychologist. He spent 53 hours with Malvo, trying to understand his motivation. In many ways, Lee's childhood was, was sort of the perfect storm uh, for what was to come. He was treated very abusively by his mother, who insisted that he uh, obey her. Uh, she would beat him if he was disrespectful, if he didn't do a good job washing the dishes, if he didn't do his chores. Then she left him, uh, and she left him repeatedly to uh, take jobs in other places and would come in, uh, move him to a new place when that place wasn't working out or when they hadn't paid the bills, and then she would disappear again. And each time this happened, he had a mixture of sort of distress and anger and resentment. He threatened to kill himself to try to convince her to stay with him. And throughout his childhood, uh, teachers and neighbors, uh, people observed how much this little boy seemed to want uh, to glom on to uh, a father figure. Malvo's partner in crime was 24 years his senior. Born in New Orleans, John Williams changed his name to John Muhammad when he converted to Islam in the mid-80s. Washington Times reporter John Ward recalls the details of Muhammad's mysterious childhood, which were mentioned briefly at the trial. He was very affected by his mother dying when he was very young, and uh, he was also picked on a lot as a kid um, by relatives. And I think he went through his entire life feeling like um, he was never recognized for his potential, he was never recognized for his talent, and he could have been something a lot greater than he turned out to be. John married Mildred, his second wife, in 1988. Together they had three children. Those who knew him felt that he was a good father. Mechanic Robert Holmes met John in 1985 during their stints in the army at Fort Lewis. Everybody thought it was the perfect family, you know. She came up here, to, they ended up getting married, then little John was born, and subsequently two daughters afterwards. But, uh, I mean, he was always uh, a little bit of a womanizer, but at the same time, he took care of his family. I'd say he was a disciplinarian, same way as I am with my child, I mean, but it wasn't like abusive strict. 
it was more nurturing, you know? I never saw John yell at his children. If he, if there was something that was out of, that he, he didn't feel they had done right, he would talk to them, you know? And so it wasn't like, here you go! It wasn't like a scream or anything. I never saw him do that with his children. One person who also witnessed firsthand the love John expressed for his children was Jerry O'Neill, his local barber, for over 11 years. John um, never raised his voice at the kids while, while, while they were in the shop. They were always mannerable. They, they sit, he would speak to them. they say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Mildred was a strong woman, too. I saw more of her influence on her family than John. Like I said, John was, was quiet. He'd come in, um, Mildred wanted his hair a certain way, and um, that was it. <laughs> For most of their married life, John was a combat engineer in the National Guard. When he was away, he desperately missed his children. He didn't like being in the military. It was something that he had committed himself to doing. And at the time, I think uh, it provided a living for him and his family, and that's what he did. He learned how to fire a weapon. He was highly trained in, in, in sniper tactics. His experience in the Gulf, we don't know exactly what that did to him. But again, there was talk of neurological damage from, from chemicals. And his wife, when he came back from the Gulf, um, said that uh, she noticed a change in him, that he became angrier and darker. On leaving the military, John began to feel bitter towards his country and the army. This would eventually turn into angry resentment towards his wife. There was a point when he changed. You know, I mean, like I said, he looked the same. He was always pretty much the same with me, but there was just something about him that just wasn't John, you know? And, John Muhammad was becoming increasingly unpredictable, charming one minute, menacing the next. The John his friends knew was different to the John his wife Mildred feared. She said she was scared of John. I remember she told me one time that John had threatened to kill her. And I said, do you really think that John, she says, I know that if John gets the opportunity, he would kill me. But she, she was afraid of him. She was definitely afraid of him. Eventually, things got to a breaking point and the couple separated. He had trouble with his marriage. Um, he took his kids away from his ex-wife. Uh, he was very angry about him, about her leaving him, even though he was not faithful to her. Uh, and so his kids, I think, were increasingly the only thing in his life that meant anything uh, and that gave him meaning. So eventually he took them to the Caribbean uh, with him unlawfully and uh, started making money by uh, producing fake documents for people down there. It was in the Caribbean in October 2000 that a lonely Lee Malvo would find the father figure he'd long been searching for. Lee Malvo's mother was desperate to move to the United States. She was willing to do anything. She would even sacrifice her only son. For $3,000, John could provide anyone with all the necessary visas and work permits. When John Muhammad came along, John Muhammad seemed to him like the perfect father because John Muhammad was a man whom he saw was taking care of his own three children, who was a single parent, who seemed to leave very dedicated to his children, very dedicated to their welfare. And John Muhammad treated Lee with the kind of respect uh, and honesty, he thought, that, uh, that no one else did. John's powerful influence would eventually change Malvo's life forever. He was really dangerous because he's the kind of guy you would never suspect of being dangerous. Um, and he would lull you into a sense of uh, um, putting your guard down, and that's when he would probably strike. He was not stupid. Uh, he was pretty intelligent, just dangerous enough. He knew enough to be dangerous to somebody impressionable like Leah. While John was in the Caribbean, Mildred was back in the States, frantically trying to track down her missing children. The authorities located John, the children were forcibly removed, and a date for a custody hearing was set for the 4th of September, 2001. You can hear for the first time on film the audio tapes from that hearing. Good morning, please be seated. Sir, if you'd raise your right hand, ma'am. You both solemnly swear or affirm that any testimony you're about to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, what is your name? Sir, my legal name is John Allen Muhammad. 
right. Sir, what is your, your date of birth? December 31st, 1960. And he thought that he was going to be able to go into court and present his side. But when he got there, they told him that they weren't there to hear anything he had to say. The only purpose was there was to return the children to the custody of their mother. John wasn't given the chance to persuade the judge he should be allowed to look after his children. Can you please tell me what's going on? There is a parenting plan that was entered by the court on October 6, 2000, last year. I was year. not aware of it. So the children were never missing. According to the court's order, they're going with mother. Are you telling me the reason why I don't have my children and won't be to keep my children because I don't have the proper paperwork yet? The orders have said that, uh, that mother had sole residential placement care and custody of the children. And when he came back, he was like, he wasn't angry because, you know, I never saw John get angry, you know, like the kind of stuff where he's throwing stuff, but he was, it was more almost like a depression type deal, controlled, but he was upset about it, you know. You do have an opportunity to express your side of the story uh, for the court to hear it, all right? And until uh, it's done, I, I, I'm not able to see my children. Uh, your visitation is suspended. The outcome of the court hearing left John reeling. He couldn't accept that he wouldn't be allowed to see his children again. Unable to understand the judge's decision, he sought further legal advice. He turned to family lawyer John Mills, who agreed to take on his case. And he was a very normal, concerned father who was disturbed by what had gone on in court, didn't understand what had gone on in court. But once I explained that to him, he was perfectly willing to, as I say, work within the system, expecting that um, we could get it all straightened out again and organized again. The effects of this decision would not only change John's life, but also 23 other lives. So he found himself at his lowest point in his life because his children were very dear to him, and he was a loving father. He was a doting father. And it's sad that the, the, the dozens of people would die and their lives would be destroyed and their families' lives would be destroyed. And that's probably what pushed him over the edge. Losing custody of his children completely devastated John. It made him angry and depressed. In Lee Malvo, John saw someone that lacked a father figure, someone he could teach and mold, someone he could ultimately turn into a killing machine. John vowed revenge on his ex-wife, but just how far would he be willing to go? One half of the deadly Washington sniper duo, John Muhammad, lost custody of his children in September 2001. He vowed revenge on his ex-wife. For the next four months, he would search endlessly for her and his children, all to no avail. And then he came and told me one day, he says, Holmes, he said, I know where Mildred's at. And I was like, where is she at? He said, she's somewhere in the DC area. During his long search, John Muhammad formed a gruesome and deadly plan, a plan that would need an accomplice. John Muhammad met Lee Malvo in the Caribbean. Lee looked up to the older man and considered him a role model. It was very apparent that he loved and admired John Muhammad. Uh, he adored him, was willing to die for him, and regarded uh, Muhammad as his, as his leader, as his father, uh, and as the person who was going to, he thought, lead a, a political revolution uh, in the United States. John, acting like a father figure, persuaded Lee to enroll in the local Bellingham High School. His favorite subject was drawing, and he proved to be an excellent artist. His fellow classmate, Chrissy Greenewald, remembers Lee well. He was very friendly and not necessarily an extrovert. He didn't really try to make friends. He wasn't you know, about to give me many details on his life. During this period, the pair stayed with a friend, Earl Dancy. He saw a side of John that others didn't. Very manipulative. He gains your confidence, he gains your trust. Once he comes up with your trust, he'll use it to his advantage. He also witnessed a change in Lee Malvo's character. He was always angry. He was always angry, um, mad. I would expect that any teenager would have been like that, but he just had a lot of anger in him for no reason at all. Lee's education gradually became more than just schoolwork. 
Every day after school, John would teach Lee how to shoot at the local gun range. John became obsessed with Lee's marksmanship. At a period of time, they would bring targets to me. And the targets were better, getting better and better. And then actually one where the target was actually dead shot, center mass. I think on one occasion, he said Lee was a better shot than him. Muhammad's teachings also included making sure Lee knew everything about guns. This was evident in one classroom discussion. One time we were watching the movie Platoon. We had just finished the movie. Someone asked the question, you know, what kind of weapons did they have? And, I mean, he raised his hand and he knew exactly what kind of weapons they had. And he could list them off. That was weird. The kid who never talks, uh, you know, knows all about weapons. Lee was encouraged to watch films such as The Matrix and play sniper video games repeatedly. Experts would later conclude that this was to ensure that the young, impressionable Lee was desensitized to the events that would later unfold. Well, he liked games that was actually had a lot of high adrenaline, you know, games that, um, mm, games that really amped you up, you know. They had a demanding daily routine of exercise and a restricted diet. They were doing some kind of special diet because they were taking something to like cleanse their body and they were both eating honey and crackers. They had this belief that you should only eat once a day to, that somehow it was more efficient for your digestive system. On February the 16th, 2002, two days before Malvo's 17th birthday, John Muhammad gave him his first big test. John was angry with a friend of his ex-wife, Isla Nichols, so he sent his young apprentice to kill her. Lee was not to know that Nichols' 21-year-old niece, Kenya Cook, would be home. On opening the front door, Cook was shot in the face with a single bullet. Lee Malvo had made his first kill. From February to October 2002, they ricocheted around the United States, robbing and killing people as their needs or desires demanded. They eventually arrived in Washington, D.C., home of the White House, and soon to become home to one of the worst shooting sprees in American history. On the morning of October the 3rd, 2002, the Washington rush hour was reaching its height. The major highways on the 64-mile beltway that rings the capital were full of people going to work. Sergeant Roger Thompson was the lead investigator on the case. He knows each crime scene intimately. There are a lot of people out. Just another one of the strange facets about this case is that no one with all the eyes and all the ears and all the people driving around, nobody actually saw them shoot anyone. Mohammed and Malvo would drive the streets until they found a possible target. Once they were in position, Mohammed would keep watch from the driver's seat, whilst Malvo would climb from the front, lift up the back seat cushion and slide into the Caprice's boot. Their first target was 39-year-old landscaper James Buchanan, also known as Sonny. His sister Vicky describes him as a generous man. Sonny was my youngest brother. He was my best friend and we were confidants and he, he just had a love for life and for people. James Buchanan was mowing this lawn right here, this grass. And he was walking in that direction. Malvo watched and waited, focusing through the gun's scope, his breathing controlled. Once he had the command from Mohammed, he pulled the trigger. The lawnmower kept going. And then he ran down this sidewalk and into this uh, parking lot here for the car dealership and collapsed in front of two employees. The bullet hit Sonny between his left shoulder blade and his spine. He was rushed to hospital, but died a few hours later. I knew, you know, as soon as I went to the door, she had his license, and I knew that it was like a nightmare, you know, that you don't want to wake up, up from. But Buchanan wouldn't be the only person to die at the hands of the snipers that day. It was the start of three weeks of unimaginable terror. Now here's the mobile station here on the left. And that center island with the, three, the two pumps there, his car was facing inward, facing towards the store. He had a car that the gas pump was 
under the license plate in the back. So he was pumping his gas there, and the shot came from across the street. From the gap in between these two bushes and across six lanes of busy traffic, the sniper had struck again. What oh, is wrong? A man has been killed in front of me. I don't know. A doctor on the scene tried to revive Prem Kumar Walika, but it was no use. The powerful .223 bullet ripped through his heart and lung, and Prem Kumar died at the scene. Just 25 minutes later, Sarah Ramos, a housekeeper and nanny, was quietly sitting on a bench reading a book while she waited for her boss to pick her up. The suspect's vehicle was parked here at this particular parking space with the trunk facing the intended victim and the front of the car facing traffic. While inside the trunk, they only pop the trunk up about this much, and the muzzle of the barrel comes out, and they shot Sarah Ramos, who was sitting there reading a book. They close the trunk and they back up and drive away, and nobody sees anything. The distance from the shooter's vehicle and Sarah Ramos is about the same as the other ones that we had that morning and subsequent uh, shootings that occurred in the Washington, D.C. area. It was between uh, 80 and 90 yards, sometimes a little closer, sometimes a little further away. The bullet went right through her and went right through the plate glass window of Crisp and Juicy, and we were able to recover a pretty pristine projectile that matched up to the uh, rifle. An hour later, 25-year-old Laurie Lewis Rivera was shot as she vacuumed her car at a petrol station. 12 hours after that, 72-year-old Pascal Chano was killed whilst crossing the street. Five people killed, numerous lives altered forever. But it was only just the beginning for two men who were on a mission to cause as much chaos and devastation as possible. It left the police dumbfounded and with no answers to give the shattered community. We just didn't know what to do. We did not prepare for what happened that morning. Children were locked in their classrooms and told not to go near the windows. There were no outside activities, no field trips, no sporting events. Life had ground to a halt. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. Oh, it was very frightening. I, I remember um, waking up one morning not wanting to send my children to school. And my husband saying we have to be normal because the more fearful we are, you know, we're going to make them more fearful. The random shootings made people hesitant to perform even the most mundane daily tasks, like buying petrol. As soon as they knew that somebody was shot at one gas station, then when it happened at another gas station, people were doing all sorts of things to keep from being shot. They would go back in their car while the gas pump was going on, or they would try to hide and get down like this to keep from getting shot, and they would look around to make sure nobody was going to shoot at them. Even catching public transport was terrifying. Sonia Wills's son, Conrad Johnston, was a local bus driver who used to escort one elderly passenger onto his bus. Whenever he got to that spot, he would get off the bus and go get her from behind a tree and escort her to the bus, telling her, don't worry, you're safe with me. They have to get to me before they can get to you. Dr. Evan Nelson is a clinical psychologist who has evaluated over 400 murder cases. He explains what may have been going through the killer's minds. Clearly, there's an extraordinary degree of planning, and, and that really differentiates this case from other types of murder cases where planning is not the element. The reality is that most murders have about 30 seconds of planning, if that at all. Part of that intense planning was to make use of Mohammed's army training and experience as a mechanic to completely alter their 1989 dark blue Chevy Caprice to suit their requirements. Crime scene expert Ralph Dano gives us an exclusive look at the adjustments they made. The firewall is cut out, which uh, would allow someone to either secrete the weapon or a person to transport themselves from the rear passenger compartment into the trunk. Once backed into position, give a signal or we're ready, the person sitting in this seat could turn sideways, lift the seat up, 
with their hand, the driver could reach back, hold it for just a brief second while the person went down and started maneuvering back. And once he's got a third of the way in, he could release it and come back up here and just leave his hand here without any common observation. So nobody knows what's going on. You've got the tinted windows. The person then transports themselves through the back and the gun is there, they're in, and they find themselves in ready to be in a shooting position. Not all the shootings were done from the boot. As the pair got more confident, some shots were fired from outside the vehicle. Ballistics expert Jeff Miller explains one of these rare times. Malvo said that he was lying here in this parking lot here at the community center near the stairway. And while Mohammed was providing a, a lookout for him, he was able to look across this parking lot, across the highway, and underneath the parking garage here of the Home Depot store. And Mr. and Mrs. Franklin were loading uh, purchases into the back of their car, and the two of them were standing just underneath the home in the Home Depot store about halfway through the parking lot. Bullet entered the left side of her head, and as it exited her head, it started to fragment inside and caused a very traumatic injury to, to her head. Linda Franklin was killed instantly. Throughout the ordeal, Mohammed and Malvo left various notes for the police. They demanded $10 million to stop their reign of terror. They were also keeping a close eye on news reports. This was evident in this restaurant's CCTV footage. Standing there at the uh, front reception area, and a news report came on about the sniper story. He walked over to the television that was hanging over the bar and actually reached up and turned up the sound so he could listen to the story. Well, the people who are interested in notoriety are usually flirting with the media. They're sending letters. For example, here in the United States, there's just been an apprehension of the, the BTK, blind, torture, and kill serial murderer. This is an individual who wrote letters to the media taunting the police, taunting the community, as compared to leaving a covert and specific letter just for the police, as Malvo and Muhammad did. I don't see any signs that these two men were taking an especial pleasure in killing, so much as a pleasure in shooting precisely, implementing a plan so perfectly that they weren't caught. But how did the police finally track down the suspects? They investigated every shooting in the Washington, D.C. area. A short time before the snipers began their rampage, a liquor store in the D.C. area had been held up. Two employees were shot. The gunman was proved to be Lee Malvo. His fingerprints were found at the scene. Malvo had a criminal record from being arrested as an illegal immigrant. Lee Malvo lived with John Mohammed here at the Lighthouse Mission in Bellingham. This is how the police were able to make the connection between the two killers. Meanwhile, Mohammed's old army friend, Robert Holmes, was following the sniper shootings with extra interest. Somebody was saying something about, it's gotta be two guys working as a team, one is the spotter and one is the shooter. So then I knew that Lee was with him. It was one of the hardest decisions of his life as he picked up the phone and called the FBI. They called me in and they started asking me questions, you know, and they were asking why did I think it was John, why would he be on the East Coast? And I told him, I said, well, I know his wife is somewhere in the DC area, you know, and then it took off from there. The police may have been closing in on the suspects, but they had not stopped the killing. On the morning of October the 22nd, 2002, the kindly bus driver who helped so many of his frightened passengers through these three weeks of terror was standing on the front steps of his bus. His name was Conrad Johnson. He was 35 years old and had a wife and two young children. Conrad was a very gentle person. I called him the gentle giant because he was a big guy, but he was very kind soft-spoken, just a gentle person, a loving family man. Conrad Johnson was here waiting to start his bus run. He would always pull over here, uh, it would clean out the bus. You can imagine it was dark in the morning, the lights are on on the inside of the bus, the entire wood line is all dark. 
At 5.55 a.m., a gunshot rang out from the woods opposite. Conrad staggered back and fell into the aisle. Some folks have been shot at Aspen Hill. Aspen Hill and what? Right here by the post office. Please, he's been shot for two minutes. He's been laying bland here, sir. Please, hurry up. I'm scared. Please send some help. I'm on the bus. The bullet tore through his liver, destroying it. He was rushed to hospital for emergency surgery. It was a sad morning when I got the call that Conrad had been shot. And I just knew that it was a sniper. About 40 minutes later, the doctors came out and told us he did not make it. And that's one day I never want to relive. That was the saddest day of my life. We went upstairs to the morgue. And when I saw him laying there, ah, oh, it was it was very very hard, very hard. This would be the last killing. Their deadly partnership, resulting in 23 shootings and 15 deaths, was over. For the police, the pieces of the puzzle were finally coming together. A warrant for Mohammed and Malvo's arrest was issued at 7.54 p.m. At 12.05 a.m., a press conference was held, announcing the license plate they were looking for, NDA-21Z. And so a truck driver in Myersville, Maryland, about 50 miles from here, heard it on the news, wrote down the tag number, and saw the car. And within a matter of 15 or 20 minutes of it hitting the news, we had a spot of the, uh, the car, and then we went into action. At 3.30 a.m. on October the 24th, 2002, Mohammed and Malvo were arrested as they slept in their car at a rest area on the I-70 highway. It's very surreal. It's like you're living in a tunnel, and you're going through the emotions, and you're wondering what's going to happen next. And, you know, I think the biggest relief for all of us was when they were caught. For the victims' families, the fact that the men responsible were in police custody helped their grieving process. The almost perfect crime had been solved. People were safe to walk the streets again. But the question remained, what turns two men into cold-blooded killers? The Washington snipers spent months terrifying an entire community. Finally, after shooting 23 people and killing 15, John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo's murderous spree was brought to an end. They were in police custody. I was just watching the news one day, and they said that they had caught them. And I don't think I saw his face. They just said his name. And uh, it kind of just, I was like, well, how do I know that name? Lee Malvo, you know, it's not your most common name in the world. Um, and I just kept thinking, where do I know that from? And it all kind of clicked in my head. And I was like, oh my gosh, this cannot be happening. This, you know, how, how weird is that? Our little tiny corner of the world, this guy was in my class and now he's killed 13 people. Mohammed and Malvo were arrested and their car was thoroughly searched. The police uncovered vital circumstantial evidence. Some of the items of evidence that were collected within the vehicle at the time of the arrest were, for instance, the Sony VAIO computer that was located in the front, uh, front seat of the vehicle. And there were several items that they had that worked with the computer. They had a solar charger. Uh, I don't know how well it worked, but they had one. Uh, they also, with uh, the Sony Bio computer, they were uh, keeping logs and they kind of kept a little bit with track of the areas that they felt were important. Areas that they had scouted out as being strong possible areas where they could wreak the most havoc. They also found maps marking not only the places where people had already been shot, but also where they planned future killings. 
There were lots of bags of clothing, um, personal items that they had. They had lots of vitamins, and they were trying to sustain themselves and water. The weapon that was used, the Bushmaster 223, with the hollow side on it, was located in, within the back seat of the vehicle. The murder weapon was a high-powered Bushmaster's rifle, the civilian version of the military rifle Mohammed knew so well. For the police, this was an essential find. Ballistics would later link it to at least 11 of the shootings. If they hadn't found it, Mohammed and Malvo could have got away with murder. Further proof was mounting. It was um, Malvo's DNA that we found in the rifle. It was Malvo's DNA we found in the notes. We did get fingerprints of Mohammed and, and uh, other evidence. The psychological reasons behind this degree of preparation is explained by clinical psychologist Evan Nelson. All of this shows extraordinary planning. They were very careful to set themselves up to do shootings in ways that they could make a quick and rapid exit. They even came back to inspect the scenes while the police were investigating it. This shows an amazing degree of calculation an awareness of the wrongfulness of what they were doing in order to avoid detection, and even a willing to flirt with the possibility of being caught because of that sense of supremacy that they could get away with this. John Mohammed was examined by court-appointed psychiatrists, but the findings were never admitted as evidence in court, so the motivation for these heinous crimes will never truly be known. By attempting to extort $10 million from the American government, one theory is that money was their motive. These two individuals were cold-blooded murderers. They didn't care about who they killed. They killed indiscriminately. They wanted the money. They wanted the fear. There was speculation that Mohammed wanted to kill his wife in order to get his children back. My way of thinking was uh, Mildred was the target in the mission. Because if, if it was just to terrorize people or to kill people even, that could have been done anywhere. If you kill 10 people and she's one of the 10, then it's less likely. I mean, there's still a chance that you're gonna get caught, but it's less likely. There's no hard evidence to prove this theory. Yet ultimately, was losing custody of his children the trigger for this series of events? It wasn't like he was a bad character and that all his life he had been doing dirty things, bad deeds. It's just that, you know, like I said, you reach your breaking point, you don't know how you're gonna react and he's over the edge. He went over the edge, and this was the end result. Despite this insight into Mohammed's motivation, it's still not clear why he deliberately set out to convince a 17-year-old boy to take part in his mission. I've evaluated literally close to 200 capital murder defendants and about 400 murder defendants overall. Mr. Malvo is in a class unto his own because of his intellect, because of his verbal skills, because of the fact that he did this killing in tandem in such a purposeful way. And uh, that's really different than the majority of murders that we see that are impulsive, that grow out of being drunk and high and perhaps sexually aroused or being greedy. And somebody wants something in that moment, they commit a murder and then they regret it. Nobody becomes a, a serial killer or a criminal for, for just one reason. Uh, I know there's a lot of debate about nature versus nurture, but even if you ask the question nature versus nurture, you're really asking the wrong question. It's always nature and nurture. At that age, and I remember, or even, I mean, I'm not even that much older than when this happened, but you just want to please the adults around you. You want to do well in all the things you do so that adults, because you're, you're trying to be a grown up yourself and you want to be accepted by them. And um, I can completely see why. If they're, and he was, his, he was his caretaker. He had nobody else to take care of him. Lee told his psychologists that if they wanted to understand him, they should watch the film The Matrix. Keanu Reeves' character is chosen by an older charismatic mentor to lead a revolution against an evil regime that had enslaved humanity. I think there was clearly a sense of him against the system. And that's probably one reason why he identified with the character Neo within The Matrix. And I think that for a young, idealistic 17-year-old, that was a, a, a frame of reference he could really buy into. There's pretty strong evidence that repeated exposure to entertainment violence will desensitize young people 
uh, and make them more likely to think that violence is an acceptable way to, to solve problems. Mohammed's radical teachings were constantly drummed into Malvo's head. They played a vital role in his conditioning. Again and again, he would uh, make political statements about the need to overthrow society. It really started to remind me very quickly of someone who was part of a, uh, a political underground or maybe part of a cult movement uh, who had been uh, brainwashed or indoctrinated. But would Malvo have killed if he had never met Muhammad? Lee Malvo basically killed because John Muhammad wanted him to kill. But those closest to the investigation disagree. No, no brainwashing at all. There, we, have, we have witnesses that uh, actually put them apart. We know where Muhammad is by himself. Malvo is by himself. He had every opportunity to leave. In my opinion, it wasn't brainwashing. This was a case of a young man who was eager to learn things and an older man who was eager to teach. So I think that young Mr. Malvo found somebody who he could idolize and adore and choose to follow as compared to being brainwashed. I'm not going to say he was brainwashed. I don't think he was. And I won't say he was a born killer. And I'm not going to say he was a product of the environment because I am from Jamaica. All my kids were born in Jamaica. Well, my, my three older kids were born in Jamaica, and they're not like that. Even though Lee Malvo was just 17 years old at the time of the shootings, he faced the death penalty. And it was really the defense team's job to try to explain why Lee Malvo did what he did. And I think by presenting to the jury uh, the evidence from Lee's childhood, from his upbringing, uh, evidence of the influence that John Muhammad had on him, controlling him and indoctrinating him. I think the jury ultimately decided that Lee Malvo did not deserve the death penalty, although he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Dewey Cornell is still in contact with Malvo. He's noticed dramatic changes in him since being away from Muhammad. He uh, really turned from being a kind of a, a soldier, a scripted, indoctrinated soldier, uh, into being more of a 17-year-old boy. He became more juvenile, more adolescent. Uh, his facial expressions changed, his demeanor changed, uh, and, and we had more of a boy on our hands. The childhood that Malvo had lost was found, but he's now in jail and will never be released. Since his arrest, John Mohammed has remained silent except for a rare few days at his trial when he chose to defend himself. I was very upset. And I was like, you know, he's defending himself. Is he going to be able to uh, ask us questions, uh, you know, on the witness stand? I think the hardest part for probably a lot of the victim's family was seeing him get up uh, uh, and uh, cross-examine at least one of his witnesses. He cross-examined Paula Rufa, who he had shot in the stomach. And uh, I think that was very difficult for LaRufa to be talking to the guy five feet away who had shot him and really, you know, traumatized his life. He said, I was there, I know what happened, and I didn't do it. So it didn't make any sense because how would you be there but yet not be responsible? It was hard at first, just sitting there, being in the same room with these two people that I know took my son's life. It was very hard for me. I had to sit there for two weeks or more with Mohammed looking at him, but he never looked at you. He would never look at you. The police were never able to prove that Mohammed had pulled the trigger in any of the 23 shootings. He was prosecuted with what was called the Triggerman Statute. That states that if the suspect was a direct helper or causing agent for the shootings, he should be held responsible for them. The rifle had given him power over life and death and over the needy teenager he found in the Caribbean. He's currently on death row in Virginia. I'll be very happy when this world is rid of them. Shortly after the trial, the families of the deceased created a memorial to the sniper's victims. 
They've made it such a beautiful place that um, the horrificness of the event and, and all those feelings that you have, could you could walk through there now and, and find some peace. I think the real justice that's been um, delivered has been for those families. I try to celebrate who he was and what he did. Sometimes you talk about on your gravestone, um, you were born a date, and there's a stash, and you die a date. You know, it's how you live that dash. Three years on, and Sonia Will's pain continues. She cannot even contemplate forgiving her son's killers. I have tried, and I must tell you, I, I, I consider myself a Christian person, and I have prayed about it. But, you know, they say forgive and forget. How can I forget? They took something that was very, very precious from me. Maybe in time I will.